You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. We did drove over to George's apartment, and uh, George came out wearing a sombrero, big sombrero, bandoleros of ammunition, two pistolas, and a big black droopy mustache. And that was because it's one of another of his favorite movies at that time was Viva Zapata. And George used to like to get dressed up accordingly. So we went to a Dairy Queen, the girls slammed the window shut and wouldn't wait on us. She was scared. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks again for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Before I get to the uh, episode with John Russo, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the passing of Wes Craven. Uh, The man was a horror icon. Uh, He made so many memorable movies and so many memorable scenes and so many horror uh, and and, uh, other filmmakers now in general all look at him and and use him as an inspiration and as a mentor of sorts. So uh, I'm planning on doing a Wes Craven tribute episode similar to what I did to Variety Piper. So look for that episode next week. Uh, I'm sure it'll be, you know, uh, very informative and I'll put a ton of uh, links for his, uh, his, his interviews in there as well. Um, so, and also, I want to say thank you to everyone who continues to subscribe to the podcast and also who rates it on iTunes. Uh, we finally got the rating minimum. So now I actually have a rating displayed of five stars. So, uh, thank you very much to everyone that does that. And, um, if you really do want to support the podcast, please, um, in the show notes, my Amazon affiliate link, it really does help out the podcast. Uh, it helps keep everything going because it actually does cost me money to actually run this podcast. And, so if you're going to shop at Amazon, it's the same exact thing. It's just using my Amazon affiliate link. Um, so, you know, without further ado, I want to introduce our, my uh, guest for this episode, which is episode 70 with John Russo. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Joining me today is John Russo. John is the co-writer of the legendary movie No Living Dead. Uh, John is also a uh, screenwriter and film director, and he's also written several amazing books on filmmaking. He is currently funding his own project on Indiegogo called My Uncle John is a Zombie. John Russo, how are you doing, sir? Very good. Thanks, Dave. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to have you here, John. Um, you know, because No Living Dead was is one of the most inf- influential movies uh, for me. Um, you know, I watched that movie all the time a- as a kid, um, even though I probably shouldn't have because <laughs> I was still young. <laughs> and uh, but I mean, I remember seeing that and thinking, "Wow, um, this is ju- you know." I I mean, you know, as a young mind, you don't really appreciate all the aesthetics and everything else. You just you know, I saw all these undead you know people. And I'm thinking, "Wow, this is this is great." And uh, I, then I I remember discovering. Uh, around that same time, I discovered the remake that, that Tom Savini did, and I thought, sure. "Wow, you know this, you know this is, you know." I said, "This is just like the other movie," and uh, you know, I, I, so I just, I just want to tell you that because I remember watching those movies as a kid all the time. Um, that and of course, you know, Wes Craven's movies, and uh, he just passed recently, just yesterday. But um, I just wanted to let you know about that, John. So you, you, you're, you're responsible for some of my nightmares. Oh, well, good. <laughs> I'm to do. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, if you could, John, uh, I always start off with the same question for everybody. Uh, so if you could, please, could you give us a little bit about your background and how you got started in, in uh, filmmaking? Uh, well, mostly I got started in filmmaking because uh, George Romero, Russ Steiner, and I met when we were 18 years old. George came to uh, Pittsburgh to go to Carnegie Mellon and on first day on campus met my longtime friend, Rudy Ritchie. They were both fine arts majors and uh Rudy said, when you come back, I was at West Virginia University, which was only an hour and a half. Well, yeah, about an hour and a half from Pittsburgh. And uh, 
duty. So when you come home for Christmas break, you go and meet this George Romero. So when we're supposed to be drawing the life model, he's he's drawing scenes from Ben Hur. So uh, I thought, well, that's good. <laughs> and uh, so I, we did, drove over to George's apartment, and uh, George came out wearing a sombrero, big sombrero, bandoleros of ammunition, two pistolas, and a big black droopy mustache. And that was because it was one another of his favorite movies at that time was Viva Zapata. And George used to like to get dressed up accordingly. So we went to a Dairy Queen, the girls slammed the window shut and wouldn't wait on us. She was scared. And uh, like, we all thought that was zany and funny. So a little later, I think that same trip, Russ was in a play at Pittsburgh Playhouse, and George and Rudy and I went, went to that play and that, that Russ. So that's when uh, George and Russ first met also. So uh, there we go, the whole group of us. And George, all of us wanted to be actors, writers, um, whatever, you know, and George particularly wanted to make movies, so we all got hooked on that idea, and things just kept going from there. You know, and that's that, that's excellent. You're able to, you know, to meet, uh, you know, so early and gain, you know, get that uh, and get that working relationship going. You know, because you know, uh, you know, sometimes John, when you, you make movies with friends, you know, you, you always, it, it, you know, you always talk about things. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I mean, there are people who I've had on the podcast before, and they always said, you know, they had a group of friends and they met in college, and they would always say, like, hey, we got this great movie idea for a movie. Let's go do it. And then, you know, and their friends would be like, nah, it's 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 took me a lot of work, you know, um, but it's, you know, and it's amazing, though, that you were able to come together and make you know, The Living Dead. Well, the good thing about it was that we all had the passion to do this, to mm-hmm. be writers, actors, and directors, and movie makers, and you name it, we were all heavily into the arts, and that's that's what we wanted to do. And when we look back at it now, I mean, we're, we're pretty amazed and gratified that we had that kind of drive. It was just... Uh, you know, and also to stick with it back in the days where movie making was really a grind and had to be done on film and you had to raise a hell of a lot of money. And today it's easy with digital production. You know, it's easy to get a picture and it's easy to add it and you can put yourself in business for a few thousand bucks. Where we had to struggle for about seven years to get all the necessary equipment together under one roof and studio space and everything else. And then you had to come up with a hundred and 50,000 bucks to make a movie. Now you can actually do it like they did with Blair Witch or, or, or Paranormal Activity or many, many, many movies they made that maybe don't get the fame or earn the money. Those films did, but nevertheless, it's an easy road to hoe, and there's really no excuse not to make a movie if that's, your, if that's what your ambition is. Very true, very true, John. Uh, especially because you know uh, Blair Witch Project and uh, Paranormal Activity, um, you know it, things keep getting cheaper and cheaper because Blair Witch, I think their budget was somewhere around a hundred thousand, and Paranormal Activity uh, the, the budget was around thirteen thousand. So it just you know and things keep getting cheaper, uh, you know, and, and digital filmmaking keeps you know, going by leaps and bounds. Well. The thing with those budgets, I mean, once the film is made, then then sometimes a distributor takes over and they'll do, you know, they'll um, do a, a new soundtrack or they'll revitalize this or revitalize that or they'll make a, a blow up for for limited theatrical dis- distribution or even major theatrical, and then they count that as part of the budget. But really, uh, you know. Those films were made. But there wasn't any hundred thousand dollars into Blair Witch. I mean, they went out and bought some cameras from Circuit City, and and they they went out in the woods with a bunch of people. There was nothing expensive about it, and all they did was scare a bunch of actors, and, and they didn't know what was happening, and they filmed it, and then they turned the cameras in, and got their money back. <laughs> so. So they didn't put any hundred thousand dollars into that movie. So I could make that movie on three thousand dollars or less. So I'm not trying to put it down. I'm just saying that's what they did, and I read all about it. So now if they're saying a hundred thousand bucks, that's I don't know what they're counting into that. It might be like Night of the Living Dead, where we got it started for six thousand, ten people putting up six hundred bucks. Then we 
and we sold got more money from other investors who paid a little more for their stock as we went along. So that was 22000 total. Then, you know, we ran up our lab bills and our supplier bills and every other thing, and that came to about 60000 And then by the time we when it started making some money, we paid some bonuses and some some uh, other expenses, the premier and everything else that came in, it came to 114000 So it just kept building like that. But really, the movie was was made on 22000 cash and a bunch of lab bills and other bills all stacked up. And a lot of tons of sweat equity. And we owned our own. By that time, we owned our own cameras and, you know, editing and dubbing and mixing and gear and everything else studio space, whatever. I figured out back then that if you had to pay for all that, it was really about a $250,000 movie, which today would, you know, if you had to pay for every single thing, which today might be 800000 or a million. Yeah, uh, very true. And, and today's dollars, so that's the way it goes. The most important thing is to get out there and get off your ass and do something. Yeah, very true. Uh, you know, that that is absolutely true, John. Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, No Living Dead, and you made fundraising. You know, uh, I wanted to ask, you know, where, you know, where did, you know, you know when you were you and uh, George were writing the script for this, you know, where did the seed idea come from to create this movie? Well, it came from me. It was my idea to make the movie. We were bitching about uh, uh, commercial clients and how fickle they were and, and they needed a good job for inexpensively. They came to us and they got a good job. And our war, our walls were covered with awards from places like the New York International Film Festival. I mean, literally covered with awards, silver medals, gold medals, this and that. And we were proud of our work. And then when they had bigger budgets, we would sometimes, you know, we would go up against, in those days, commercials that cost 100000 bucks, and maybe ours cost 6000 and we beat them in competition. So, you know, we were a really tight-knit production group right there, back then, you know, and we learned the hard way. We learned from doing. But we all were talented. I mean, that's the other thing. We were super talented, and that's pretty much proven by the fact that through all the struggles, we still have careers going. But anyway, we were George Romero and uh, Richard Ritchie, who was Rudy's cousin and worked for one of, one of the ad agencies that we did for sometimes. We were, we're eating you know, a grilled provolone sandwiches and drinking beer for lunch at, uh, at a bar around the corner from our studio and uh, bitching about the clients and Fickleness and Rudy, uh, Richard said, Well, why don't you do something about it? And I said, Well, you know, we ought, what if we uh, had 10 people, the six or seven of us that work at the Late Image, which was our company, um, and, and, and a few others, the close associates, and, and so 10 of us each put up 600 bucks, even if we have to borrow from finance companies or relatives, we'd have 6,000 bucks. And if we shot, 35 black and white and work printed down to 16, we could we could make some kind of movie, maybe a horror film that would be better than what we're seeing on Children Theater at late night. So George got all excited immediately, like he always got any time there was any prospect of making any kind of movie on our own. And he slammed the table and said, we're going to make a movie, bang, and all bottles and glasses went flying, and people in there stared at us. And Richard said, you're crazy. And I said, well, you want in or out? <laughs> he took a drag. He had this, he had this dramatic way of, of uh, you know, sort of posing. And he took a deep drag on the cigarette, let the smoke out slowly, and said, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> That was the start of it, and we had a couple sidetracks where we thought we had actually a comic idea of uh, uh, space kids, space teenagers coming to Earth and hooking up with Earth kids and now because it was almost E.T. before there was E.T., you know, and, and it was uh, – we're in that vein because because now these Earth, Earth kids were hooked up with these space kids who – you had things that looked like magic, you know, and they could play all kinds of pranks and wreak some havoc on this town and on the dumb sheriff that was was going to be played by Sheriff Cassano. We call him Sheriff Suck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and 
when George Casano was going to be that sheriff later, and then when it turned into a horror film, he, he immediately got cast as the sheriff in, in what became as Night of the Living Dead. So that was uh, that was it. The idea of it and of making the film, and then George and I started uh, bashing ideas around and working on typewriters in our separate editing rooms. <laughs> And uh, I said, whatever we do, that, this is when we, we decided it had to be a horror film and had to be simpler than we couldn't show saucer landings and things like that that would be too expensive. So so I said, well, whatever we do, I'm going to start in a cemetery because cemeteries are spooky and people are scared by them, even in things like Ellen Costello and Dracula. So... Um, the the uh, then uh, George went uh, went away in the middle of this and he went, he came back after a weekend and he had written a story it wasn't in screenplay form it was in story form about a girl being chased and you know the brother comes and they get to the cemetery and put a wreath on a grave and the girl ends up being chased and so on and so on in essence it was the beginning of what became Night of the Living Dead except you know, I read it and I said to George, uh, I guess it was about 30 pages he had written. I, I, I said, you know, this has all the right twists and turns and suspense here, but, you know, who are these creatures or what is chasing the girl because you don't say? And he said he didn't know. And I said, well, it seemed to me they could be dead people. And he said, that's good. I said, well, but you don't say what they're after. They don't claw, they don't bite, they don't... What are they after? And he said he didn't know that either. And I said, why don't we use my flesh-eating idea? Because my idea was, which I'd written a few pages of it, that they... they um, uh, the aliens come to Earth in search of human flesh, but I was avoiding the whole spaceship landing thing by having a kid run away from home, and he steps through... Uh, he's looking back over his shoulders in the woods, you know, and he's cracked. He steps through a pane of glass that's embedded in the earth, and under the earth, under the glass is a rotting corpse. And so, the the, uh, the these aliens you just would discover later in the story that that they that uh, they like they like their, their human meat rotted, just like in the Middle Ages, people would kill a goose and hang it up to rot for a few days before they ate it. So that's how they became dead people after human flesh. And I'm, I tell that story a lot now because I don't always get credit for that. And without those two ideas, you really don't have Night of the Living Dead or, or you don't have the modern flesh-eating zombie or anything that came after Night of the Living Dead. So... That, I, and I took all that material, I rewrote George's thing, put it in the screenplay screenplay format, and then I wrote, uh, after, you know, we had some script discussions further with me and George and other people, and then I wrote, and then I wrote the, rewrote his part of it, and then wrote the second half of the screenplay myself. Then we went out to Richie's house where we were going to, he only lived 10 minutes from Pittsburgh, so we were going to drive out there, grill some steaks, drink wine, read the script and talk about it. George read it, said, uh, something's missing. And uh, he says, uh, something's wrong with it. And he, he didn't say what. And he had it, here, Rudy, you read it. Rudy read it and said, there's nothing wrong with it, it's fine. So George thought for a second or two, and he said, I know what it needs. It needs uh, another siege. And by that, he meant that there needed to be a point three-quarters of the way through the film where the ghouls almost succeed in breaking into the house but don't. And that would make some suspense and drag the plot out a little more. And then they finally break into the house and overwhelm it. So we didn't write it. We just did it. And a lot of the changes we made as we were filming, we didn't write, uh, you know, except maybe brief notes, and then we just did it because it was pretty a pretty complete script anyway. You know, you didn't need to really formally write 
some of the things we changed. Yeah, you know, and that's a you know a pretty interesting story, John, because you know about you know how those ideas all came together. Uh, you know, when you were working with George and your your you know two ideas as input, and then uh, you know and you kept you know letting this idea evolve uh, to the point you know where it actually was a you know a solid you know uh, 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 fully fully realized idea, and then you all of a sudden now you have the screenplay that you you know you worked on, and you, that goes through a couple evolutions, you know, and, and then when you you know you were able to actually find make a living dead you know when, when you were making that you know did you have did, did you at that point think that this was going to you know you know sort of be the the, the cultural phenomenon it ended up becoming no we didn't think that we had total belief that we were making a good film we knew we were making a good film especially when we started putting it together, syncing up takes and looking at them. But all the way through, we had we had total confidence in our ability. We were solidly behind George Romero as the director, and he was the lead guy in our company at that time. So, um, you know, and like I said, we were a tight-knit production uh, unit. Uh, the main people there were uh, Russ Streiner, who did a great job producing the film, and being and uh, he's also played the Johnny character. You know, they're coming to get you, Barbara. And then um, Gary Streiner, who's Russell's brother, who was a little younger than the rest of us, but one of the best recording engineers I ever worked with, probably the best. And he just was instinctively did it without millions of dollars of equipment. He would get he would get mixes, sound mixes that were better than the people that had the million millions of dollars worth of equipment. So, uh, and just a great person. And we had, we all had like this sense of humor, zeal, drive. You know, um, our receptionist was Jeannie Anderson. Larry Anderson worked there. He was the only one of us who didn't kick in his 600 bucks. <laughs> he wanted to, He said we should take that same money and make a make a real mother of a commercial that would put us over the top in the commercial film business. But uh, the rest of us wanted to do that. We want, we we always wanted to make feature films. What we ended up doing. Let's see who I who did I leave out. Vince Servinsky should never be left out. He was older than the rest of us, had been through the Second World War, and what a great guy. He was a production manager, and I mean, all of us were jacks of all trades, and, you know, as filmmakers and in and, 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 and many other ways. So, let's see, Gary, Vince, Russ, myself, uh, we were the main people, and then we had some close associates like Rudy that would come in. Rudy Ritchie would come in from time to time, and you know Carl Hartman and Marilyn Eastman. We had worked with on commercials, and they would they had acted in our commercials. So we figured right away, well, let's invite them into the party because they can kick in their six hundred and also act in the movie. So they became uh, Harry and Helen Cooper. I have written uh, The Boy in the Basement, the bit, one that's bitten as a, well, it was a boy named Timmy, and Carl said, well, my daughter can do that, and that's how, so Timmy became Karen, <laughs> and that was Kyra. <laughs> so, so we didn't need to write that, you know, we just did it. It's now Karen instead of Timmy. Then in my, dra- uh, my version of the script, uh, the Tom character, was a 40-some-year-old cemetery caretaker, which is logical, hiding in the basement with the Coopers. They all made it down there. And then we decided that uh, uh, all horror films had young, you know, sexy girls, and we wanted to have that, so we gave Tom, made Tom younger and gave him a girlfriend, Judy Ridley. So... And we, 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 that's what we had to write. We, um, the, um, uh, so Keith Wayne played Tom and his girlfriend, Judy, Judy Ridley, who was Carl Harmon's receptionist at the time. And we were all kind of smitten with her because she was so beautiful. She's still beautiful. So, uh, then at one point, Keith was, Keith was flying in from Washington, D.C. He was performing there. He was a very good singer and uh, got a lot of gigs. And 
and he had to fly him to do the. We needed a scene that showed empathy between the two young people, not the audience caring about them because they're going to be blown up in the truck. So we're all bum, you know, bummed out, exhausted, and everything else from these 18, 20 hour days. George and I are under a grape arbor at the house, and we're trying to come up with an idea for this scene. And I was greatly relieved when George wrote it. <laughs> 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 and I, I was so punched out, I thought it was good. I guess it is pretty good in a way, but it's pretty schmaltzy if you really look at it. And, uh, you know, I remember the face Molly were still about that small for me and all that stuff. Schmaltz, but it worked. So... The uh, the uh, there were other things that we changed in, in making the film. Somebody I don't know who I don't think it was me suggested bringing the brother back and having having him drag his sister out in, in the at the climax of the zombie attack. And we did, we did debated that because you could think he you know we thought he was dead. When he hit his head against that, when he gets smashed against the tombstone, but we figured that maybe the brain wouldn't be completely dead from that, and the audience would buy that he came back, you know, as a zombie, and we decided it would work, and it did. It's one of the most horrific, surprising, shocking things in the movie, so, you know. Yeah, and, and we all did many things, you know. I was the I volunteered to be set on fire with real gasoline because I said we're going to look dumb if none of these dead things catch on fire, and we got a yard full of Molotov cocktails. So I did the stunt, got three takes, and they're all in the movie from different angles. So, and then I was the general's driver in the Washington D.C. scene, wearing my army uniform. I had just gotten out of the army. And um, that uh, you know, so whatever we, whatever it took, we did, and that's how it was. And everybody knew exactly what to do, though. That's an important point. Nobody needed to be guided or directed about hardly anything because, like I said, we were such a creative bunch, and and so you know, on the same page, creatively and and and. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, professionally, I mean, we just knew what had to be done to make a movie. So that's we had done hundreds of movies by then. I mean, a lot of TV commercials, industrials, but they were all very demanding things, and they all required, uh, you know, logistics that that worked, and different kinds of logistics, and different kinds of effects, and different kinds of filmmaking techniques. And we had honed our skills over those years. Yeah, you know, uh, I remember you know, when I saw them like, the first time. Uh, I remember saw them, like you know, I remember the zombies catching on fire, um, and I, you know, I uh, about two or three years ago I went to uh, Pittsburgh because uh, they they were having a Living Dead festival for uh, to save the Hollywood Theater, and they you know Russ was there, uh, Gary was there, and they they also got Kara. Uh, they've got a, a few of the of the zombies too uh, to come in. Um, George uh, Kusana was supposed to be there, but he couldn't make it. Um, but but they but they had everyone there, and they also had these you know amazing posters, and they were telling stories, and uh, you know, and uh, it was just great you know to also hear like you know we're hearing right now just all those great stories about how to about making this movie. Um, for one that really uh, uh, made me laugh was uh, I think her name is um, Maribel or Mar- I think I, I forget her name. I'm, I'm sorry, but. Uh, uh, she actually told a story that she was – she applied to be a zombie in the film, but she didn't know she was applying to be a zombie. She said um, that, that uh, she saw an ad or somebody told her that it was going to be a, a love story, and uh, she went and she, she applied, and she's like, oh, this doesn't seem like a love story to me. This seems like something different, and they uh, – I think somebody – I think maybe Gary or Russ told her, oh, it's going to be you know a horror film, and uh, – uh, she and they said, "Do you still want to be in it?" And she said, "Sure, you know." And then uh, the day of, she got had to be, uh, you know, all made up to look like a zombie. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but uh, I was supposed to be there, but I had the flu, so that's why I wasn't there um, that day. Um, anyway, um, I can't think who that might have been. Maybe Paula Richards. 
I could have sworn she had a, a Paula worked for Hardman and she she was a zombie in the movie at that mm-hmm. time. I don't even any married Bell. Yeah, I'll have to look, I'll have to look at my... I would face. remember that, name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm I, sorry. I forget her name off the top of my head. Um, oh, that's okay. But, uh, but you know, so, you know, I wanted to ask, so, you know, when when you finally released No Living Dead, and, you know, and, um, you know, what was your, you, you, George, and Russ, and Gary, you know, what was your response when, when all of a sudden this thing just sort of t- took off? Well, we were really glad and happy because we worked so much hard on it, and you never know. And Russ and I ran the world premiere. You know, we, we did first class with cleat lights, and car, red carpets, and the whole limousines and the whole thing that we, none of which we could afford, but we did it. And uh, we decided, horror film or not, you know, we're giving it a first class opening. So. We had a, the screening at the Fulton Theater, which was a main downtown theater then. And then we had the cocktail party afterwards at the William Penn Hotel, which was a major hotel. So, and then, but everybody worked, you know, we, Russ and I sent out tons of packets of, of uh, I wrote the press kit, put that together, and then we mailed those out to 40 or 50 different newspapers, radio stations, TV stations, and there, Hardman and Maryland, Carl and uh, Maryland worked their butts off printing eight by 10 stills. They, Carl had taken most of the production skill, stills, probably nearly all of them, and then they had a photo lab there in their studio, and they just printed tons of stills, and every packet went out with two or three stills at least. And then the shareholders, by that time, there were like 27 or almost 30 of us, and then we had posters made eight and a half by 11, passed them out to everybody, and then people told them to put them up in their offices and on telephone poles and bulletin boards and everywhere. And we got a lot of press on the movie, <clears throat> even from little neighborhood uh, newspapers, whatever, all over the place. And that all helped. And then the um, Walter Reed Organization, Continental Pictures, was, was a distributor of the Continental branch of Walter Reed. They didn't do much very well. <laughs> but one thing they did well was their TV spots were really good and uh, the right kind of thing. I, I wrote the copy for the TV spot, and they didn't use all of what I wrote, but some of the key lines they did. It's the dead against the living and a struggle for whatever, forget right now. But um, a night of absolute terror, I remember that. And they got this guy who was famous for doing the Boris Karloff type voice, and he would be hired to do uh, the voice, uh, the narration for tons of horror films, trailers. And so they got that guy, and it was a very effective trailer. And But I think, um, I mean, we made it look like the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it worked. The, 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 the uh, Theaters had to take out, the theater chain had to take out ads apologizing for turning people away from the drive ins. When we drove up and down Route 51, one of the main, main arteries going into Pittsburgh, there used to be a lot of drive ins on that strip. And the cars were backed up out of the drive ins and on the Route 51, holding up traffic. So yeah, that, that's amazing. So that thing in a big way, and the other thing is that the picture paid off. So, you know, it's one thing to hype a thing and get an opening crowd, but then it's another thing for that crowd to be happy with what they see. <laughs> <laughs> so it just took off everywhere, and, uh, you know, we thought we were going to be rich and should have been rich, except for the ripoff that started happening immediately in uh so, you know, the whole thing launched our careers, and, uh, and um, you know, but we, we didn't know it was going to go on for 50 years down there. Still, you know, it's still going. So, uh, it hasn't reached 50 yet, but the 50th anniversary is coming up, you know, in 2018. We're starting to plan some big things happening, you know, like a national tour, if not a world tour all kinds of things, festivals and conventions and whatever is going to happen. Yeah, that, that, maybe, a re, maybe another remake. <clears throat> I mean, a world tour, that would be absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. 
in 2008 for the uh, 40th anniversary, we did a national tour, kicked off in Dallas under the auspices of the American Film Institute. We did around 12 U.S. cities, and then we did the Sieges Festival in Spain and some of the other the foreign bookings for some reason. There was supposed to be five or six countries, but uh, I don't know exactly why they didn't come through. It's pretty hard sometimes to coordinate all this stuff. But maybe for the 50th anniversary, it's going to be even bigger. That'd be excellent. And I know, um, I just, you know, it's funny I noticed, but I know Japan also. I mean, they're huge in the zombies. So I know if you did a world tour, you have to, you'd have to stop in uh, in Japan at some point. Well, we thought we were going to. Japan was one of the countries that was talked about, and. Uh, and I, I don't really know why I didn't go to the throw who still is George's con- uh, convention booker. Mm. And he was handling all the bookings then, so I'd have to ask Chris why, if he even knows why. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't find out. You just, uh, you just, uh, you know, you deal with these bookers, and then for one reason or another, the booking doesn't come through, and that's it. So. Okay, well, I mean, it would be, yeah, I mean, I, I completely understand, John. You know, sometimes, you know, things, you know, obviously don't work out. Um, but, you know, but I mean, you know, uh, you know, that 50th anniversary would be absolutely, you know, phenomenal. Uh, 50th anniversary tour, excuse me, would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, because, uh, I mean, they, you know, everyone still you know, talks about that movie. Um, everyone still has seen that movie, at least, you know, at some point. Um, you know, and, and you know, you, and obviously with your career, you know, you ended up following, you know, that up a few years, you know, a few years later with uh, Return of the Living Dead. Um, you know, you got to work with Dan O'Bannon and, you know, and it sort of took the zombie genre. And this time, though, it was a little different because the zombies were actually talking now. Um, you know, so I, I mean, I, want, I wanted to ask you. I mean, I know, I know, I'm going, you know, pretty far from 1968 to when Return of the Living Dead comes out, but. Um, I just want to ask, you know, did did you and Dan actually, you know, brainstorm this whole idea uh, about, you know, just sort of taking the zombie genre to the next level where they sort of talked and and uh, sort of moved a little faster? No, uh, not at all. Okay. Um, no, uh, we wrote uh, Rudy Ritchie, Russ Reiner, and I collaborated on a on a script for uh, Return of the Living Dead, and it was straight horror. Mm-hmm. And it. It, 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 the opening revolved around a religious cult, which there would be a religious cult springing up if the dead started coming back. And they believed that dead still needed to be spiked or burned because, you know, because there was always a threat that the epidemic would start all over again. And it establishes that. And it's, it's straight, stark horror, just like Night of the Living Dead, but it's different. You know, it, it deals more with... Uh, the uh, uh, the human population going to hell in a handbasket and turn against each other because of uh, during during a zombie outbreak, uh, and then and then I was supposed to direct it, and most of the ideas in it were mine. We assigned Rudy to write the first draft, then I wrote a couple of other drafts to take some of the things out that didn't work and fix it and. Uh, then um, at one point Frank Sinatra was going to finance it, and then we, I went to Las Vegas to meet with him and his lawyer. And you know, to make a long story short, his mother was on the way to an opening night party where we were all supposed to go. When her plane went down, she was killed, and so that deal, deal fell through. And that was a long chain of different deals that fell through for different reasons, which was goofy to me, but it's a goofy business. So then uh, we sold, then Tom Fox came into the picture and he decided after paying a lot of option money and this and that, that he wanted to just buy the script and by that time we said we better, let's just sell the script and get a lot of money and the hell with it. And um, I wanted to hold on a percentage of it, but Rudy and Russ didn't, which was dumb. <laughs> so so, uh, so then, uh, eventually, um, Tom got a deal with Hemdale and Ryan. Or I don't know how that came about exactly, but but they 
Because they said straight horror is dead, you got to make it into a comedy. So they hired a man to rewrite and direct. And so he then put the comedy into it and changed the script pretty drastically. And then I novelized his script, and then it got made and became a hit. So that's the you know the shorthand of it. There's a great documentary called More Brains. The story of the return of the living dead, but produced by Tolly Hudson, and my part of it was filmed by my good friend Robert Lucas, who's going to co-direct my uncle John as a zombie. So, but I figured prominently in the opening of the uh, documentary because I was the only one that knew all the story, all the details about these deals and ups and downs and twists and turns. And Tom Fox had died, so I I was the one that knew that stuff, and I'm, so I'm in the documentary a lot, telling the story in greater detail than I've told it here. Yeah, I I mean I imagine you know, the documentary would go very in depth. Um, so I I know we were kind of you know pressed for time obviously on a podcast, but uh, but that you know it's very interesting though. I mean that whole I mean having Frank Sinatra <laughs> you know uh, talk about financing a zombie film, I, I've never actually heard that before. I've told it a lot in different places, so but I was friends with the um you know, people in that organization. They liked me, they had read the Return of the Living Dead novel and they wanted to help. And so they were really great people, so we were close friends. So so the two bodyguards, Tony Nino and Joey Rizzo, they brought it to Frank. Frank they probably told him about all the pain we were going through with the rip-offs and everything else. Even so, you know, Frank was that kind of person. But we got help from a lot of places. I mean, you know, Paul McCartney's uh, father-in-law and uh, brother-in-law, the two John Eastmans, helped us at one point in the lawsuit. And the Sinatra people helped us at different points during the lawsuit. So lots of people wanted to help because they thought it was a great movie and we didn't deserve to be ripped off the way uh, we were getting ripped off. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, and that would have been, you know, uh, if Sinatra, I mean, I, it actually had gone through and actually financed uh, Return of the Living Dead, that would have been, you know, something, um, because that, that just seems, you know, I, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like something that would be up his alley, so to speak. Because, uh, you know, whenever I think of Frank Sinatra, I think of the Rat Pack, you know. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it, you know, it's just, it, that is a one of those interesting movie-making stories, John. Um, and, uh, you know, that is just phenomenal. And I will also, everyone, link to, um, you know, uh, Brains on the show notes. Uh, I'll link to it on Amazon or wherever it's available, uh, if it's available separately to be sold. Um, but, you know, and, uh, you, know, you, you know, you mentioned, John, you mentioned um, your, your latest movie, which is My Uncle John is a Zombie, uh, that you're currently crowdfunding on Indiegogo. Uh, you know, could you tell us a little bit about that movie, please? Uh, yes, I'd love to. Um, well, I was a guest of Kirk Hammett at his Fear Fest he- Evil in uh, in San Francisco, and um, Rob Lucas and I were both there. And while I was there, the Epics TV channel was filming a series of commercials to promote their slate of zombie pictures. This was in 2014, I think, maybe 2013. And anyway, so during the during the Fear Fest evil, I and Kirk Hammett, by the way, for people, like he's the lead guitarist of Metallica, and I've been to several of his events, and we become friends. So what a great guy, and you know what a great band. So and Rob was Rob was always a Metallica fan, and and does he's a videographer for Kirk now, and and so. We all hooked up, and then I went over to where they had a <clears throat> green screen set up in one of the hotels, and they shot this 30-second commercial where I'm a zombie, and I was put into makeup by a lady who does this for, on television. And it was like I was telling the story of how I became a zombie. And they did one with Kane Hodder and one with Tom Savini and one with P.J. Souls and I think Greg Nicotero. They did seven or eight of these different spot, 30-second spots. But everybody, when I 
Well, then I had lived about about a half hour's worth of material as as this zombie. So by the time I got back over to the Fear Fest Evil, the producer Mike Ruggiero had emailed Rob and said Russo knocked it out of the park. And they thought mine was the best commercial, and it was seen by, I guess, a, I don't know, a million or more people. And uh, it was so, people thought it was so funny, I thought, well, I should write a full length script. So I wrote My Uncle John is a Zombie. And the idea, and people can go and, you know, on our Indiegogo site, My Uncle John is a Zombie. And 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 so uh, sci-fi, a friend of mine, a model, she has black arts clothing, and she's a fire breeder, and a actress, and model, and very beautiful. So she's going to play my niece, and my nephew is going to be played by Gary Vincent. He's been in several low budget movies, but he's also also publishes some of my books, and we work together on a lot of things. So Gary plays this dumb security guard who's my nephew and and at sci fi is this gorgeous fire breeder and so on and she's the niece and they've kept me hidden for forty years and fed me secretly and you know what they'd be feeding me. And now they decide to bring me out in public and campaign for zombie rights. So <laughs> <laughs> So the, some people think he, Uncle John is a real. Uncle John retains his wit and his sense of humor because he was always such a reader and such an intellectual that he didn't lose that part of himself like most zombies do. So he's able to to say clever and funny things to the news media and whatever. So so um, some people think he's a real zombie. Somebody thinks. Some people think it's a hoax, but a lot of people buy into it, and John, Uncle John becomes world famous. And when he becomes world famous, there's a guy played by Chuck Corby who had the lead in my movie, The Mob Boss and the Soul Singer, also available on Amazon. But Chuck's a good actor and singer. But he plays this character named Stush, who runs a zombie hunting camp secretly. And he charges people big bucks to come in and hunt down zombies that he has to create. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they kidnap Uncle John, and they're going to they're charging a hundred grand to each hunter to get a chance to kill this world famous zombie, and everything builds to this great zany climax. So it's it's pretty funny. It's very entertaining, and it's going to be fun doing so. It's already been fun. Oh, okay. George Cassana is also in a plan of sheriff. Uh, we, we can't say that he's that he's <laughs> he, he's accused of killing a black man on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't really mistake this black man for a zombie. He killed him on purpose because he's a racist redneck. But he turns out to be a good guy and helps rescue Uncle John. So those are some of the highlights, I guess. Yeah, but we're going to make the movie. Uh, we're just doing the crowdfunding to raise some extra money because we want to put, put a couple name horror stars in it, you know. So we're going to shoot in November. Now, uh, are you at liberty to say like any of the horror stars you're trying to get right now? Uh, well, Debbie Rashawn has expressed interest, and I just sent her the script, so I don't know if that's going to work out schedule-wise and whatever, but, you know, I've worked with Debbie on many things, and not just films, and uh, and so she's great, and uh, she she may play, there's a, um, a TV, uh, when you first meet Uncle John, he's he's in the cemetery and with sci-fi and um uh, and his and his nephew Oscar, and uh, and uh, and Mandy Frost comes to interview them and, and, and Uncle John, and she she's the first one to put him on television. And she turns out to be a, a villainous at all, you know, villain, an evil woman who wrecks the whole thing. And I I kind of have that in mind for Debbie if she wants to do it. Schedule permits. And so you know, so and that's amazing though, and especially you know nowadays you know with digital filmmaking and everything. But you know, it's, it's great too that you know crowdfunding has become so uh, uh, so democratized where everybody can you know 
uh, post a project. You can try anyway. Yeah. It's not that easy, you know. Oh, no, no. So so we don't know if we'll succeed with the crowdfunding, but we appreciate any help we can get. And, uh, you know, we aren't rich, unfortunately. I haven't made a lot of money, but uh, a stockbroker got me <laughs> when the planes went into the towers. <laughs> so projects like this I used to fund on my own, and now I can't quite afford to do that. So I have some investors, and, uh, and uh, then we're going to do the crowdfunding. Yeah, uh, you know, I, and other people are, you know, uh, are doing that as well because it, it's almost, you know, uh, this work actually works. Crowdfunding works twofold. I mean, I, again, uh, I agree with you, John. It's not easy. You know, the people I've had on, you know, we've we've talked at knowledge about crowdfunding, uh, everything from, you know, its early days. Because I mean, I, I, you know, I did it back in 2008. Uh, you know, all, using sites, meaning using sites like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, um, from those early days to days of, you know, where it's uh, to where it is today where, you know, people launch crowdfunding campaigns and, you know, a lot of them don't succeed and, you know, they sort of go back to the drawing board and find out what didn't work. Um, you know, and, and it's it's not easy. It's a full time job, and it's always about getting that word out about you know, and having a pre, good pre launch about getting that email uh, list up. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, because uh, but you know, I, I mean, anyone's listening to this, I'm going to link to to John's um, Indiegogo in the show notes. Um, I, I I mean, I uh, I'm going to donate to it because I think it's hilarious. Um, and one and two because I'm a big fan of John Russo, so that's why I'm going to donate. Well, I certainly, certainly appreciate it. You know, no. uh, we're going to keep uh, plugging at it. Like I say, it's not something that's not going to get made. Mm-hmm. You know, it is a movie we're going to make, and, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward. It's it's going to be fun. I mean, it's constantly entertaining. So, if, you know, I don't know if the script's on as one of the rewards or not, but. Uh, Gary uh, Vincent did the um, Indiegogo site. He also created my website. If you want to, people want to check that out, johnrussoentertainment.com. You can uh, you, know, you can buy things if you want, or you can just keep up with uh, the news. I'm going to Scaricon, by the way. My next convention is Scaricon, and that's in Verona, New York. Um, this coming weekend. It's a really good con- convention. It's in a casino, so you can go there and lose all your money <laughs> 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 and not have anything left to buy. <laughs> George Cassano were there. At the, we were at the first one three years ago, and we made some money. You know, it wasn't real big because it was the first one, but it was big enough. And, and the, the food is fabulous at this place. But we hit a two thousand dollar jackpot in the casino. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm well, not guaranteeing a jackpot to everybody that goes to Scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> It'd be one of the rewards for sure. <laughs> And I and I just I just took a look at your crowdfunding campaign on your Indiegogo, and yeah, the uh, the twenty dollar perk does actually get you the script as well. You get a digital copy of the script. Um, oh, but yeah. I, but I will link to that in the show notes, and also uh, I will link to uh, Scarathon as well in the show notes as well. So anybody in the area uh, can go to the casino and and you know as John said, you, there's some good food, but he can't guarantee you you'll hit a jackpot, or you might just lose, <laughs> <laughs> you might lose all your money instead. It's a beautiful place. I mean, there's a lot to do there. It's a resort. It's not just a casino. So you can have a real good time there and uh, and uh, meet a lot of us who are in the film, you know, the horror film business and so on. So um, and, and it's always fun. At the, I, I enjoy the conventions. Yeah, they they can really be uh, be great. Uh, I'm hoping to meet George at one of these conventions. Um, the I, the ones I, I which Casano or Romero? Romero. I've actually met yeah. Kasana, but uh, well, he does uh, he does quite a few. I I don't know his schedule. Uh, we were at Wizard World in St. Louis. We did that one. He and I. Uh, we weren't together, but you know our tables weren't together, but we were both there. Um. So I can't remember. I think he's doing one of the Walking Dead. You know the Walker Stalkers, but I'm doing. Uh, let's see. 
I have a big, heavy schedule. I just did the barbecue in Richmond. I was in Chicago twice for Flashback and Wizard World. But Gwar, by example, I mean, I'm really good friends with Gwar, Brad Roberts, Nicole, and the whole band. They're really, really bright and, and, and gracious people. And, and it seemed like there's a big relationship between, symbiotic relationship between horror and heavy metal. And the heavy metal people, they just think I'm great, you know, because of my Living Dead and everything. And uh, I really respect their musicianship. So I got Scarecon, then the next weekend, the Wizard World in Columbus, Ohio. That's a Bruce Campbell event. Um, then I have the Evan City Night of the Living Dead Festival right in Evan City on October 9th, 10th, and 11th. Down in Sacramento the next weekend. Then are the Night Risers in Kentucky. That's October. And then I'm going to Germany for the first time in November. So, Weekend of Horrors, it's called. But all the stuff's on my website, johnrusoentertainment.com. And I will. Oh, no, by the way, do you know Night of the Living Dead got inducted into a classic movie Hall of Fame in uh, California? Yeah. A couple I, weeks ago, and on my Facebook page and on the website, you can see a picture of me with the trophy. Yeah, I actually remember reading about that. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. That was a that was a really nice event too. Yeah. I, it, all of it is fun, and the great thing about it, even for aspiring filmmakers or writers, you know, you guys, you have to get these conventions. You have to network. You know, nothing happens if you stay home. Very true. Very true, John. Uh, you know, and, and I want to say, you know, uh, I, I know you, you know, you're very you're a busy guy. And I know you're, you're pressed for time. And I, I just want to say, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm so happy, you know, you came on this podcast. I'm happy we got to talk about Another Living Dead, Return of the Living Dead, and also your new project, My Uncle John is a Zombie. And you have to hear all these stories. And um, I just want to say thank you very much. And also, it's, it's, you know, all your advice about, you know, about what to do and, you know, actually going out there and doing things. Um, I think a lot of people end up having paralysis through analysis, and they just sort of talk about making a movie rather than actually making one, if you know what I mean. Well, writers have done that, so-called writers. (laughs) have talked for centuries, have talked about their writing more than they've done it. So those kinds of people don't succeed, and they wonder why, and they get bitter some of them, you know? Yes. So, so don't get bitter, do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay, well, I thank you. Uh, you know, people like you help keep us going, help us, our careers go, and our connections with fans. So thank you very much. Oh, my my pleasure, John. And I, everyone, I will link to everything John talked about in the show notes. So if you ever, uh, you know, didn't worry about catching something that uh, maybe John or I said, uh, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of everything is going to be in the show notes, uh, and it'll be and it's all clickable. Um, so it'll automatically take you wherever you need to go. And um, so that's why I always always remind people, John, the show notes page is so critical because they, they, it's like a wealth of information at the you know of, of everything. It's all you know all mm-hmm. categorized. It's all nice and ordered. So everyone, you know, it's very easy to navigate through. Uh, but uh, but John Russo, I want to say thank you so much, sir, and uh, I want to wish you the best of luck with uh, my uncle John as a zombie. Thanks, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and, Have a good day. Oh, thank you. Okay. Do the same, John. Please stay in touch. Okay, I will. Take care. Bye, bye, John. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.